Right, President Reginald Streeter. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you and um, all your listeners. So last month, you were elected the new president of the school board. Before we get into things you're thinking about doing, policy, that kind of stuff, can you tell us what the school board is and what the president does? Yeah, so uh, thank you for that question, and I'm happy to answer that question. So the school board is a, it's a nine-member board that sets the policies, um, procedure, not the procedures, the policies. We dictate um, how the budget is uh, divvied up or we approve the budget. Um, but on top of that, we also advocate, you know, for things such as more funding and things of that nature. Um, even the mayor appoints us and city council confirms us, um, which means that's the democratic nexus point um, of having the appointed board. But uh, but, but that uh, but with that with that being said, um, I will say that that's yeah I think that's the end of what we do. So for the most part, um, we also have uh, monthly action meetings as well where we discuss issues. Um, and do the work of the board. Um, sometimes we may have, uh, you know, community engagement uh, by way of uh, having uh, special meetings per year just for the purpose of hearing from the public um, as well. And we try to partner as much as we can with the school district to uh, do the work this, for the students. Okay, so you, you were a student of the school district of Philadelphia. In the time since you were a student till now, uh, what has changed? What are some of the major differences? Um, wow. So I uh, went to Germantown High School, uh, which is uh, sad, sad to say it no longer exists, went to Lee's Middle School. So I think that's one of the biggest differences, I think. Um, but um, at that time, um, when I graduated, I actually looked at my, uh, my high school diploma. And uh, I noticed that we didn't have a superintendent. Um, and the district, I think, was in the type of uh, trauma and, and crisis that I would argue uh, doesn't exist right now, even though there are some issues that we're dealing with right now. I think the district is in a better well, posi well positioned place to, um, to do what we need to do for children as well. And I think um, the, we're, we're also what we're different right now is that we have to make decisions, but I think that we're better funded than we were back then, but I still will say that we're still poorly, underfund poorly underfunded for what, we, what the children deserve in Philadelphia. So as the school board president, who do you answer to? Who are your constituents? Our constituents are every stakeholder in Philadelphia um, who has a uh, has an interest, um, whether it's business community. I, I'm not saying them first as if they're the most important, but children first. I would say we are student centered. Uh, we make our decisions from a student centered perspective, but also the teachers, um, all of the staff that work in the school district, parents, uh, you know, other or other organizations or institutions within Philadelphia that has to coordinate with the district or they would like to coordinate with as well to give our children the uh, educational experience that they deserve. Um, and obviously there's also, you know, working with city council on the budget uh, without uh, city council's uh, support. Um, and we're appreciative of the budget, the budgetary, uh, the money that had, the, the funds that have been sent into, that's been given to us so far. Um, they're also, I wouldn't say they're constituents, but they're a partner. And then obviously the mayor as well. Um, the mayor appoints us, um, I think he constructed his board in a way that uh, with certain talents and skill sets. So the board as a unit um, is very well, well positioned to uh, lead this work. Now, you, you had mentioned that it, you know, Germantown High School, which is since closed. Um, would you support or vote for any more neighborhood school closings? Well, that, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, you know, so when you think about the types of services and the types of extracurriculars and the types of uh, tools that we would like to give all students and opportunities. Um, we, we also have to think about being good stewards of public dollars. And the last thing that we wanna do is find ourselves in a position where we are on the cusp of or being taken over by the state. But even with that being said, uh, right now we're in the, we're, we're in the beginning for our portions, not in the beginning, we've started the process of what our facility planning process uh, where we have gotten stakeholder engagement. Um, there may be more stakeholder engagement coming in that space um, to figure out what what the school district should look like. And it might, might, might mean closing some schools in some places, but building brand new schools in other places. Um, we've been building schools. Uh, we have schools like Cassidy that is being built right now. And we think that having showing the, showing the public that we are building um, and that some of the newer schools will have the amenities and the types of things that won't break, for example, where you need change orders and things like that to fix. Maybe people will be more open-minded to, hey, well, maybe I, I'm attached to this building because of what it means to me, but maybe it's time to rebuild 
uh, the school district in a way. And, we're, and what I think what we're trying to do is what Washington DC did, where they took a step back maybe 15 or 20 years ago and looked at the system of, of school buildings that they had, some of which are old, um, just like our buildings are old, and thought about reimagining their district in a way and letting the infrastructure also dictate where that is. So, um, so that's, that's, uh, that's where we are with that. But as far as building the closed schools, again, I think if we had, if, if it is made, if it, if it is made, um, made, uh, I guess, um, if it is a, hey, if you don't do this, you're risking destabilizing the system or having the ability to, uh, to, to run the school district um, while also thinking about where do we build at the same time. I mean, I can see, I, I can't say I can, I can't say I would, but, um, but that's, that's the answer I have for you today. Okay. Um, one of the things that we, we heard a lot about, and this is going back a couple of years, actually, um, we get a lot of questions about this. And we actually got a couple of questions about this uh, when we told people you're going to be joining us. Uh, will you as president look to change the speaker policy mm -hmm. so that everyone can have three minutes and, and not limit the number of speakers per meeting? Well, I mean, I mean, no, no people don't like this answer, but um... You know, there's currently litigation ongoing right now, so I won't go too deep into the facts, but I will try to give you something. Um, I would just say the, the policy itself is not intended to limit speech. It's not intended to uh, pick and choose who gets to speak. It's actually intended to give individuals an opportunity to speak in a way where, the, but the business of the district can still get done. The business of the board can still get done. Um, so as far as the time limit, right now there's a litigation. There's litigation ongoing right now, but uh, we're we're going to hold Pat, I believe, until we uh, decide until what the court decides. But right now, I think the trial is actually starting in a few weeks. Um, so I mean, let's just say stay tuned. Okay. Um, and, and the last thing I'll ask before I, I uh, bring Denise in, you know, charter schools are like a third of the school district budget. It's it's a lot. Um, would you consider having public charter hearings for renewals and for applications? Um, so we actually, did, so, so some of the process right now is public. So um, the way it works uh, as it relates to decisions for renewals um, is there is a public meeting where we discuss on the record based upon um, evidence or data that's brought to us by the charter school office, whether we will decide to uh, start the process of not renewal, right? So. Right now, there are hearings going on right now as it relates to some of the non-renewal decisions that, that have come up. Um, they are publicly accessible as well. So um, I, I, I think that we're already doing things in a public way. But I know that others are saying, hey, you know, there's more things that you all do that should become public. I think all of that stuff is on the table. Again, I've com I'm committed personally. And again, I have to get eight other board members to agree to be more communicative and being more open about the process. Cause I do think it's important for people to understand why we're making certain decisions and decisions aren't just, you know, arbitrary or capricious or just, or just doing things because we want to do them. I'd like to bring in Denise Clay Murray here on the phone line. Hi, President Streeter. Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. Thank you. Now, one of the things that has come up a lot when it comes to the school district of Philadelphia is the fact that the school board is not elected, mm -hmm. that um, it is appointed by the mayor. And, and when the school was, when the district was under um, state control, part of it was appointed by the governor. Have you thought about the po possibility of an elected school board? And if so, do you think it can work here in Philadelphia? Um, I, you know, the board wants to stay apolitical. It's trying, it's striving to stay apolitical. And I think that is one of the things that our forebearer, the SRC, was, I think, accused of constantly making political decisions behind closed doors and things of that nature. So, so even so, with that kind of in the backdrop, I would say personally, I think that um, right now we just got local control back. I think it is important to note that city council confirms. So, city council has the opportunity to veto any decision that the mayor makes as it relates to who the mayor appoints. Um, and, and, and with that being said, I think that as it relates to whether it could work, I'm not sure, I don't know. I do say, I will say this as a sitting board member, I do like the fact that I am not beholden to any special interest. No one helped get me elected. There's no one who can call me tonight and press a button and say, hey, I helped get you elected. Therefore, I need you to do this. I think this model when done, done correctly 
can it gives the Board of Education the runway to have a student-centered focus. I think too often decisions are often made with the adults in mind first. I'm not talking about the parents and we're not talking about the children first. Um, so that's, and I think that could be borne out by some of the allegations that have come out. People saying that the board is doing this for this reason or that reason, when in fact that we feel comfortable that we're making decisions thinking about children um, first. Um, and it's not just in the charter sector or the but also in our in our monthly meetings, we make a point to hold ourselves accountable, put the data up for everybody to see, and ask the district questions of what are we going to do about it as it relates to student achievement, making sure our children are feeling safe and loved in their schools. So I know it's a roundabout way to say it, but I think this model works pretty well. I think city council is the kind of political arm that I think balances us, you know, to you know remind us, you know, as it relates to the constituents and things of that nature, and we're going to do better as well to 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 engage directly with the public. But I do like the fact that I don't have to check with a donor. I don't have to check. I don't have to worry about running for election. My all of my time is toward the children. Okay. Now speaking of charters, um, I've um, because I, I'm a freelance writer when I'm not doing this. I've written about the charter school situation, particularly when it comes to charters run by African Americans, um, for more of a few of the outlets that I work with. What have, I guess, because the argument that a lot of these schools are making is that you're trying to shut us down just because we're black owned. Despite the fact that when you look at some of the test scores, they're less than impressive. How do you, I guess, how do you get folks, um, what have you, what does what have you learned about this particular situation and, and how do you kind of explain to people that this is not a product of racism this is a product of numbers so i mean it's i'm not trying to bring my personal um skill set but i'm a discrimination attorney i do employment discrimination work so i understand the theories of action whether it's Disparate impact is where a policy tends to have a disparate impact on a certain group over others, or whether it's disparate treatment where there's explicit forms of discrimination at play. I don't think uh, the, the explicit forms of discrimination are at play here. I would argue as black folk that, as, especially as a fellow black, as, as a sister, you understand that typically in America period systems, we don't may not come to the table with the requisite uh, resources or the requisite institutional knowledge due to brain drain, things like that, that can actually, that, that, that I would argue may create disparate outcomes for us in general, right? I think that's a different conversation than, hey, you're closing this down because you're Black. But I think the difference between this and an employment discrimination case is that if there's an issue, for example, of background checks, right? Racism or not, I don't, I don't, I don't think that a school should stay open or a school shouldn't be asked to comply with the law if indeed those things are occurring, right? I don't, I, I so that's kind of where we're, we're a student-centered approach. Yes, we understand you're a black-founded charter school, right? We understand that you might be a BIPOC-founded charter school, but what we're trying to do is is is, is say that we are student-centered. We care a lot about student outcomes. We care also about the school to prison pipeline and things of that nature. And we're trying to find a way to bridge the gap between the district and how we're becoming, we're student centered and the charter schools because in one way or another, we, the children are matriculate from the charter schools to the public schools and the public schools back to the charter schools. And these are also public dollars that we have to make sure are being spent accordingly. And again, that's, that's the perspective. So um, it's unfortunate that that is what's been stated and there's a, an ongoing um i wouldn't even call it an investigation we we hired a third party to come in to do i guess an independent investigation just to sit, just to do a, a third party look at whether there is indeed disparate impact or disparate treatment between uh, charters uh dependent upon who runs them but we're all about the children and the last time i checked there are many non-black founded charter schools that are servicing the same black children um and and, and I think that's, I guess, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Now, how did you find yourself on the school board? Because I, I think that's an interesting story. How did you, how did you find yourself on the school board? And, and what have you learned about education 
from this experience that you didn't know before? Okay. Um, and actually, I wanted to add something to my last answer, if I could. Okay. So, and I'll answer your question. We do, but I, I will say personally, I think that the charter school law itself is the problem here. It does not give us the free way, the freedom or the mechanisms necessary to think about equity, to move resources from maybe better supported charter schools because they may have access to outside dollars or what have you to the charter schools who need help, right? So, so we're compelled by law to do certain things. And because we compelled to do law by certain things, it may have a disparate impact. Again, that's yet to, we still have to figure out whether, whether that is us or the system, but I will argue that it is the law. But anyway, to get back, answer your question. Um, I think, so the way that I got on the board was uh, one of my uh, close colleagues um, told me, hey, I think you should apply for the Board of Education. Um, you know, I also heard rumors that the mayor was really trying to find a black man to be one of the uh, one of the people to be considered. And I said, um, first I thought about it, but then I thought to myself when I became a lawyer, I said, I wanna be able to do something that can impact our communities in the quickest and fastest way in addition to being an attorney. So I've been on other boards, whether it's the Barrister Association of Philadelphia, the ACLU in Philadelphia, things like that. But I always felt that I wanted to have a more closer impact on um, our community. So. Um, I put my name in a hat and then um, I had a conversation with the family um, and everybody said it's a go and I found myself on the board. Uh, I, I never would have thought growing up <laughs> that I would be on the Board of Education of Philadelphia. So I feel completely blessed to be here. Well, what have you learned about education from your service on the board that you didn't know before? It's an onion. There's a lot of layers. Um, and I think if we're not communicating in a way that is constructive about why we do things. It's easy for assumptions to be made. And I think it's easy for uh, the public trust that I think we have to still earn um, to, get, to, get, get, to, to be given. Um, also, I would say, I think what I've been more surprised about is, and this is not to mention any names or any groups of individuals, but how what it means to be student-centered, I think, means, diff means different things to different people. Uh, some might say, well, it's really the those who are the custodians of the children, they should have you know, a bigger voice. Or some might say, we say it's the student and the parents, um, that piece, and just how poorly underfunded we are. Um, I think when you have 60 cent on the dollar, what, what is necessary to, to uh, educate children you find yourself feeling like you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, and this isn't something that's a secret. It's something that we've known for 50, 40 years. And yet, and still, we're still fighting to have fully funded education. Okay. Well, well, thank you so much for taking the time with us. And, and, and just you know, to kind of put a bow on my particular participation, I started out as an education reporter. And I started covering politics because I started noticing where those two intersect. And I found that teachers didn't know enough about politics to be useful and politicians didn't know about enough about education to be useful. So we thank you for coming on because maybe we'll be able to get a little education to the people who are actually in charge of implementing policy. And um, again, thank you. And I'll take you back to Larry McGlynn, who's our co-host, and you're listening to Hall Monitor on WPPM 106.5. All right, thank you very much, Denise. Uh, President Schreer, I just have one last question for you. In the beginning of the interview, I asked you what the difference between uh, you know, the school district was from your time as a student to, to now. What I'd like to ask you now is, what do you hope the difference will be between now and the time you come off the board? Well, I, I, so there's right now, um, I, there was a co conversation that began, and I, and I, I think it's a form, it, not a form, it, it is a form of engagement where we set out and asked Philadelphia, what superintendent did Philadelphia want? Um, and it wasn't just a half, you know, baked way of doing it. We did a lot of legwork as a board to really figure out what the Philadelphia want. That conversation is still continuing now. Um, through the uh, through our through, through the current superintendent, Dr. Watlington, our, our great superintendent, the um, the uh, his his implementation of his strategic planning process. So, so I would hope that his, first of all, his strategic planning process was a success, and in five years we can see the fruits of that labor. Um, 
Number two, I mean, I would love for us to be on the pathway to um, ensuring that every child in Philadelphia, uh, charter or non-charter, um, is uh, not only in a loving, safe place, which I think our buildings and our school districts, our school district uh, buildings are, but also that the children are leaving high school with the skills necessary to do whatever they want to do when they grow up. Um, and so, and in addition to that, I think the final piece again, if we can secure full full funding of public education in Philadelphia, um, and I guess there's some other pieces too, more black teachers, uh, more black men as teachers as well. Um, I think those things. I think you're going to, with those inputs, you can have the outcomes that we're all looking for. And I guess final final. I keep going, but my final final piece is um, is for you know is for some mechanism or way for us to have said. So I can say that we engaged with the public. No policy is going to work, even if it's a good idea, if you don't have engagement and buy. You're not going to get the patience and you're not going to get the, the, the uh, I guess, the grace that you, you may need from time to time from the public if you don't do that. Um, so those are my goals. And final, final one, if we can depoliticize education just a little bit more. I know you can't completely depoliticize it, but when it comes to student-centered uh, or, or decisions that have to be made for children, I would hope that everybody can get on, on board with that. Well, I, I think one of the things you'll find as president is that everything is political. <laughs> and um, but but what what I want to do is, is not just thank you, but doubly thank you because I want people to understand this position is not paid. You have a full time job, you have a family, and you're doing this, which is the very big job. Um, so so we thank you for that for being with us. We thank you for for the work you're trying to do, and you will do. So, President Shearer, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much.